guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled Neighbors dumped horse manure on their front lawn to make our life hell. To put it plain and simple our next door neighbor is a complete and total nightmare. Before I get into the good stuff let me just tell you a little bit about what led up to this insane situation. I have been neighbors with this guy for about 20 years and every single day has been a nightmare. This is the kind of neighbor that will start a fight with you over the smallest thing because he enjoys conflict. Some of the things he has complained to me about is that my trash is blocking the fire hydrant, it wasn't, there were lights on in my house at a time that he considered to be too late at night, he even complained that there were leaves on my lawn during autumn when literally everyone had leaves on their lawn, including him. He also ended up building a fence that was on my land just to have a fight about it and waste months of my time having it be put on his side. Any one of these things could make a small story on itself, but I think nothing will top the craziest thing that this guy did. One morning I woke up to the sounds of a dump truck outside. I honestly didn't think anything of it until a horrible smell came through my window. I finally looked outside to see that he had dumped a ton of horse manure on his front lawn. More specifically the part of his lawn where the property line was, albeit it was completely on his side. The smell sure wasn't though and I was getting ready for another round of fight with this guy. All pleasantries were gone years ago with this guy, so I was cutting straight to the point. Me. What the hell is going on out here? Neighbor. I'm just getting some fertilizer delivered. He had a sneer that he loved to wear on his face when he knew that he was riling me up. I couldn't help the anger though. Me. This has to be a ton of manure. You don't even have enough land for it. You are just piling it up on the lawn. Neighbor. It's on my property so you should just go back inside and not worry about it. The other trucks should be gone soon. Me. Other trucks? Neighbor. Of course, I need more than just this. It's the finest horse manure that money can buy. And if I catch you stealing any of it then we are going to have a big problem between you and me. Me. I have a problem now. The smell is revolting, you can't just leave it out here on the yard. Neighbor. I can do what I want on my property. This is perfectly legal manure, so you better get out of here before I call the cops on you for trespassing. I went back inside to my wife and started fuming while explaining that this jerk was doing. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the window while I watched two more trucks come and dump manure into his yard, almost creating a line between our two houses. There wasn't a fence because after I had the other one removed, he never rebuilt. I have no idea if this was his idea of revenge, but I wasn't happy about it and wasn't going to just sit there and let something like that happen. I called every number that I could find that seemed relevant for something like this. The town, the sanitation department, even the mayor's office. It turns out that the law did state horse manure was valid to use as a fertilizer on their property. Unfortunately, there was nothing in the local law about how much you could have or even amount per area of land. Probably because nobody before this was even crazy enough to think about pulling a stunt like this. At the end though I was basically told there was nothing I could do since it was on his property and wasn't technically causing a biohazard or anything. I was still that morning and I already felt exhausted from trying to figure out how to fight him on this one. One thing I knew for sure was that he was being vindictive because there was no way the smell wasn't bothering him just as badly. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of being next to a giant pile of manure, but in case you haven't had that unlucky pleasure I will explain it to you. The smell was so bad that the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and we had constant food cooking in the oven just to try and fill the house with some other kind of smell. Still even with the doors and windows shut tight the smell seemed to seep into our home. We couldn't have guests over anymore and we started to feel extremely isolated in our own neighborhood. Our son just had a baby and couldn't bring her to visit because of how bad the smell was. You might think one would get accustomed and used to it, but nope. It just seemed to get worse the longer it sat there, and neighbor wasn't even using it on his lawn. We were fed up and still looking for things that we could do to have him get rid of it. We called a couple different lawyers who all told us that even on a higher level there was nothing illegal he was doing that we could sue for. It really felt like we were living inside of a trash can or a dump. 
Even everything we owned seemed to pick up the smell so even if clothing came right out of the laundry and we came right out of the shower we carried the scent. People at the stores would avoid us and our friends understandably were making excuses to avoid us. I would have done the same thing in their positions honestly, I wouldn't wish this scent on anybody. Well except maybe for neighbor. So, I know that you are waiting for a big revenge of what we did to finally get back at neighbor. In the end though he actually ended up dying and the property being sold. We never found out exactly what he died from, but it's probably a good idea to mention that he wasn't the youngest man in the world. He could have died of old age or something else. My guess was that he knew he was dying, and this manure was one last fuck you to us before he moved on to the afterlife. So, you might be asking what happened to the manure pile. Without anyone living there the land became the problem of the town and obviously they weren't going to be able to resell the property in that state. So, trucks were brought in, and the pile was finally removed. Hilariously and ironically enough the grass that was under the pile was all dead and seemed starved. The smell hung around a bit longer before finally fading in our lives, and sense of smell, could return to normal. The next story is titled. $50,000 collector cars are eyesores to homeowner association. Okay, so I've been dealing with this for the last three months and it has finally reached its climax. For a little backstory, I own a towing company and am currently renting a home within an homeowner association e was not informed of when I signed the lease. My wife and I broke ground on our dream home days before lockdown went into effect last year. We signed a two-year lease as we were offered a $250 reduction in rent if we did. The house has a three-car garage attached to it, as well as parking for an additional two cars in the driveway. I keep my tow truck in the driveway or parked on the street in front of the house as it is classified as an emergency vehicle by the state and not merely a commercial vehicle. This means it is not against the homeowner association to have it in the neighborhood. We also own many cars as all three people living in the home are car nuts. Now we do not keep that all at the home, but we do have a total of six cars at the home plus the tow truck which means two vehicles are always parked on the street. For reference the cars we keep at the home are 1. 1967, four-door Chevy Impala, 2. 1967, Ford Galaxy, 3. 1993, Mazda RX-7, 4. 1994, Nissan Silvia, 5. 2013, Subaru BRZ, 6. 2008, BMW M3, of these cars all of the imports have wide body kits that cost between 4 and 12 grand. This is important as to value of vehicles as well as looks. Look up Rocket Bunny and Liberty Walk to get an idea of what they look like. Okay now for the story, after living here for just over 9 months and as the lockdowns were ending, the world opened its weary eyes just to get punched in the face again the homeowner association that we had absolutely no idea existed started by ticketing the tow truck which is parked on the street stating that it cannot be parked on the street. Okay, I'll put it in the driveway no problem. Pay the $150 fine to the homeowner association after getting the contract from the landlord and reading it, I figure it's best to just go along with it and not ruffle any feathers. By moving the tow truck into the driveway I started parking the RX-7 on the streets. Of what the car looks like from the company page. Now the reason I listed the other cars, the two classic cars are kept in the garage, as well as the BRZ as it is my project car and I'm in the middle of building a very high-end drift car out of it. The other two people in my house drive the BMW and Nissan every day. The very next day I return home and there are tickets on both the RX-7 and the Sylvia which are parked on the street by our driveway. Numerous neighbors are also parked on the street mind you without tickets from the homeowner association. I immediately call the Ahole in charge of the homeowner association to ask what the hell is going on. Ahole tells me that our junk is devaluing the neighborhood and cannot be parked on the streets and cites a rule in the homeowner association guidelines about vehicles being in disrepair or essentially a junk status needing to be put in a garage. I laughed, full on gut chuckle. The guy I'm talking to drives an early 2000s Cadillac that may be worth 10k. Ahole tells me that if the vehicles continue to be parked on the street, he will have them towed. Okay let's play. I told a hole that he needs to read his own manual and look at the vehicles he is talking about. Clearly both cars are not in disarray. A hole 10 days after the initial ticketing calls for a tow truck and this is where I should mention that the reason my tow truck is listed as an emergency vehicle is because my company has the county police contract for their towing, as well as the township. 
When small guy towing, SG, shows up to impound my vehicles I am not home, I get a call from SG that he has been sent to impound my cars. We know each other from the businesses we operate and I often kick him work when we are holding over a 90 minute ETA to not upset customers. SG tells me that he has to tow my cars due to his contract with the homeowner association, but he doesn't have a truck that can tow these lowered cars without damaging them. SG asks me to come home and remove the bumper so they will go on his truck. I told SG that it wasn't going to happen, and I'd hate to look for other guy towing to send overflow work to while we see how the courts feel about the impounding and potential damages to the cars. SG wisely decides to not tow the vehicles. Now this was October of 2020. Since then, SG has called me dozens of times about a hole calling him repeatedly to tow the vehicles, SG telling a hole that the only company in the area that can tow these vehicles is my company. Finally on July 5th a hole calls my company to impound my cars. Okay, no problem. I sent three of my guys over in the shop pickup to drive my cars back to the shop where they were parked and kept for the last month. The wife started driving the Impala regularly as it is summer. Friday. We went to small claims court as I sued the homeowner association for towing costs $250 per vehicle as well as storage on each vehicle $62 per day each and an additional $3,000 for inconveniences due to not having the cars for daily transportation. Add on an additional $1,500 for lawyer fees. After roughly 5 minutes the judge asks for photos from a hole of the cars. A hole gives the judge photos. The judge comments on how nice the cars are, and they clearly are not in disarray. I thank the judge and ask him if he can see the Cadillac parked on the streetway in the background of the photo, as well as the other five or six cars in frame. The judge affirms this and asks a whole about these cars. A whole states that they are not in violation and even coughs up that the Cadillac is his car. The judge smiles a toothy grin and confesses to being a car guy and estimates that each of the two cars that have been impounded are worth 50k each and that a holes Cadillac would clearly be the eyesore of the community. The judge then dismisses the homeowner association's claims and explicitly tells a hole that he is not to tow any vehicles out of the neighborhood without police confirmation of their disarray or abandonment. Judges goes further and states that the homeowner association is in violation of the township ordinance as the streets are not private streets but belong to the township. The judge then grabs what I assume is a calculator and starts punching away. After about a minute and a half of pure silence the judge looks up and says. Okay, as stated before a holes claim for the homeowner association has been dismissed, as for you slash Whipsolo's countersuit I will rule in favor in the amount of $10,100.65.50 in court costs to a Ahol's homeowner association. A whole lost his freaking mind. A whole went on a rant about communism and how the judge was the problem with this country and into election conspiracies and every whack job theory you'd hear from people like Alex Jones. The judge warned a whole twice and finally ordered him in contempt and invited him to have a weekend stay on the county's dime at the local jail. A whole will be home tonight as the judge set to release him at 6 p.m. The cars are back in their original spots and I cannot wait for the hand wave and grin as a whole comes home this evening. The last story is titled. Poaching threats and frogs lots and lots of frogs. This is another story about Pops, my grandfather, and how he got some sweet, sweet revenge on Dunn squatters slash poachers. This goes way back back to the 90s to be exact 1998. I was 10 years old. My farm back then was Pops family farm it's way up north in Ontario. My farm is not a small farm in the area it's the biggest plot of land not only that it has the most workable farmland. There's about 80 acres of good workable farmland that's including pastures and another 120 acres of dense forest and marshland it is northern Ontario. Back in the 90s northern Ontario had a breakout of this type of moth they would spin silk high in the trees really they caused no harm other than a nuisance but the government had the great idea to crop dust the forests on Ontario causing an ecological disaster. With the loss of the moths and the chemicals in the water a type of frog was nearly wiped out we called them leopard frogs. They are ray green with these big black spots on them. After that they were put on the endangered species list. The back end of my property runs off into a small marshland and into the lake and back in the 90s Pops was having a problem with poachers. They were camping in the back area hunting out of season killing and eating turtles out of the marsh and just fucking up the property. Back in the day that forest was my playground I know that area like the back of my hand but unfortunately I had a run in with the poachers. 
They threatened to shoot a 10-year-old child of course I won out there with pops and our local lawman but they had packed up and were gone before we got there. Unfortunately they returned the week after we could hear the rifle shots. Pops tried to find them with the lawman several times but with no luck. Now here's where all the information from the start comes into play Pops as hard as he tried wanted them gone but it wasn't working. Pops was also a fisherman and his favorite bait were bone other than the leopard frog. But because they made it on the endangered species list the use was outright banned. Pops being the responsible fisherman and generally caring about the land figured oh hell now's the time to kill two birds with one stone. He approached the Canadian fishery and game wardens and through a lot of work got in touch with an ecological survey team who decided that our little marsh was the perfect place for a spawning pool to raise little leopard frogs. And that's what happened the back area where our marsh was fenced in and they started breed tadpoles to brood in our marsh not only that the poachers hunting ground happened to fall in the protected zone. Once the work happened it took a full year for the poachers to return. But Pops had a weapon now. His phone. Once he could hear that familiar sound of rifles going off where no rifle fire should be he made a single phone call to the game warden. They had over a dozen wardens up there in less than an hour and the poachers were caught. Not only were they caught with the carcass of a bear and other animals they were found with buckets and buckets of our little leopard frogs. They were caught but not only did they hunt without a license they also poached an endangered species to be used as an illegal bait. From what learned through the locals, they did two years in big time prison. All because Pops cared about the little froggies. Oh yeah over 5 million of the frogs were raised on that marsh over 10 years being released through marshes and forests in Ontario. You would have a hard time finding a leopard frog across Ontario they was not somehow related to a frog that came out of my little marsh. Thanks for listening.